humans. Why we're unlike any other species on the planet. But you can say that about any species. For example, kangaroos. Why they're unlike any other species on the planet. Most people are convinced that humans are different in some special way that makes us unique. But you can say the same thing about every species. So, humans are unique just like every other species. But what does that mean? No. Human uniqueness. Now, pre-Darwinian myths maintain that a supernatural alien influence made humans different from other animals. Now, this is not uh, new. For example, in Egyptian, god Knum made man here out of clay on a potter's wheel. And someone didn't like Knum later on. They, it was, became a false god. And then there is the Greek myth of the making of man by Prometheus. Prometheus is here making man, again, on something that looks like a potter's wheel, while the goddess Athena looks on. Now, Prometheus made man from clay, but then he gave him fire. He got into trouble for that. But when Athena saw that Prometheus had made man, Athena said, you know what? I'm going to give man reason and a soul. And there's a painting of Athena doing that for us. Now this theme of an alien influence changing us is also something that's present in the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, in which there is a black monolith, an alien influence, who influences our chimp-like ancestors and essentially turns our chimp-like ancestors into modern humans. Now, the conceit of the film is that humans are so different from other animals that an alien influence must have been responsible for these differences. So again, you have some alien influence changing us into modern, different people. Now, Carl Linnaeus was a Swedish biologist who invented the Linnaean system of biological classification. And he wrote, I think in Latin, and here's what he wrote. I demand of you and of the whole world that you show me a generic character by which to distinguish between man and ape. I myself most assuredly know of none. I wish somebody would indicate one to me, but if I had called man an ape or vice versa, I would have fallen under the ban of all the ecclesiastics. It may be that as a naturalist, I ought to have done so. So he's feeling guilty about uh, separating man from ape. Now, later on in England, there's Richard Owen on the left at the British Museum, a very excellent anatomist, and Thomas Huxley, also a younger, competitive, also excellent anatomist. And in 1860s, they had what's called the Gorilla War. And what happened was um, Owen dissected a gorilla brain and announced that human brains have a structure called the hippocampus minor that ape brains do not have. Based on this, he said that uh, that the small part of the hindbrain was peculiar to the genus Homo, peculiar to our genus. But Thomas Huxley looked more carefully at these gorillas and he debunked Owen's exaggerated claims for human anatomical uniqueness. And then three years later, Thomas Huxley went on to write this book, Man's Place in Nature, in which he compared us, our skeletons, to the other apes. Now, here is this, this phylogenetic tree that we've been looking at for a long time. And when you ask the question, uniqueness of what? We've talked about the uniqueness of human beings. And then compared to other primates or chimps or gorillas or orangs. Anyway, the, different, the uniquenesses depend on what you're comparing humans to. Now, because chimps are our closest relatives, the number of uniquenesses that this group has is the smallest when compared to this group. And um, so let's consider an example, the, uh, the uh, Caterini, the uh, old world monkeys. Now, old world monkeys have nostrils that are close together and directed downward. That's what our nostrils do. And when a tail is present, it's never prehensile. It's never able to grab onto branches. Only new world monkeys have tails that can do that. We also have flat fingernails and toenails. They're not like claws. And we have 32 teeth. Now, teeth are an important issue. So let's look more detail of the, the teeth, the dental differences. On the left, you have platyrines. And you see at the bottom, you say three premolars. 
Catarines, we have two premolars, and if you're a teeth expert, that's a gigantic difference. Now, part of the catarines are the apes, the gibbons and the rest of us, and then part of the apes are the great apes, or the hominids, and then part of the hominids are the hominins. That's everything that evolved uh, after our lineage is seven million years ago, split from the lineage that led to the chimps. Let's look more carefully at that. Here's a blow up of that. And the if we look at the hominins, we know that about four million years ago, the Australopithecines evolved. And then about two million years ago or so, the, the genus Homo evolved. And there are all kinds of other critters in that group. And one of those lineages led to us. Now, we're interested in human uniqueness. So we have a list here of human characteristics compared to other primates. And there's a large, long list here. Brains become enlarged, high forehead, held, head held vertically, etc. Now, most of these are due, the, most of these uniquenesses compared to other primates are due to our transition to bipedalism. For example, all the ones in green are associated with this transition. The others are apparently are not necessarily. So instead of comparing humans to uh, primates, let's compare them to chimps. And you get the same thing, because chimps are not really bipedal, so you get these unique characteristics of humans. So there's a skeleton of a chimp, a skull of a chimp on the right, humans on the left, and you can see this ginormous canines on the chimp. And uh, here's a f the frontal version of the same thing, large canines in chimps, very small canines in people. Also a difference between humans and the other great apes are we have 23 pairs of chromosomes and the other ape apes have 24 pairs. Now look on the left here and you can see in orangutan, gorilla, and chimp we have 2A and 2B. But then at the bottom you have humans and you can see that 2A and 2B came together to form the second largest human chromosome, chromosome 2. Now, our closest living relatives are the two species of chimp with whom we share a common ancestor that lived about seven million years ago. But a lot of what we call unique to humans would not be unique to humans if Neanderthals Denisovans or Homo erectus or Homo floresiensis were still alive today. They had common ancestors with us respectively 0 0.5 and 1.6 million years ago. And since 7 is much larger than 1.6, which is larger than 0 0.5, which is larger than 0 0.2, and I have 0 0.2 there because that's about the time in which, that's the earliest divergence between the different groups of what we currently call Homo sapiens. Uh, but because 7 is larger than 1.6, these other hominins are much more closely related to us than chimps are. So our uniquenesses are, compared to these more closely related ancestors, are, are less. So, human characteristics compared to chimps are these, but if we compare it to Australopithecines, which also happen to be bipedal, then all these uniquenesses go away. And so we talk about human characteristics compared to Australopithecines, the list of human uniquenesses gets smaller. Now, one, a few things that we have, we call uh, uniquely human, are cooking and fire, language and tools. These are things that presumably are unique to us, even when we compare ourselves to Australopithecines. So let's compare ourselves to Neanderthals. Now, Neanderthals are bipedal, just like Australopithecines. And they, are, since they're closer, humans become even less unique. And maybe the only thing that's left are this high forehead when we compare ourselves to our cousins, the Neanderthals. Now here's another issue, is the chin. First of all, you can see the two skulls here. The Neanderthal skull is much bigger, and so it had a bigger brain, Neanderthals did. But also humans have a chin, and Neanderthals have no chin. So there's a human uniqueness we can be proud of. Now, so we keep on asking ourselves the question, what makes a modern human? And here are the modern humans on one side of a divide, and the, our ancestors, the archaic ancient humans on the other side. And I think what makes a modern human is that realizing how closely related you are to your ancestors makes you a modern human. Now that goes against the idea that's promulgated in books like this, The Gap, the science of what separates us from other animals, in which the separations, the things that separate us are 
held to be very, very, very important. But I take an opposite view. I think what separates us from other animals is the extinction of our closest relatives and the sparseness of their fossil remains. But to interpret this, I don't think there's any higher purpose or meaning in this, since it's true of every species. The more your closest relatives have gone extinct, the larger the gap between you and the rest of the biosphere. Now, what can you conclude? Well, either your set of adaptations are not generically useful, hence your relative isolation on the phylogenetic tree, or possibly your species is genocidal, also sometimes known as competitive exclusion. In his 2017 book, Science in the Soul, Richard Dawkins wrote the following. The whole system of labeling species with discontinuous names is geared to a time slice, such as the present, in which ancestors have been conveniently expunged from our awareness. If by some miracle every ancestor were preserved as a fossil, discontinuous naming would be impossible. So using the discrete names of the Linnaean system, like Homo sapiens or Macropus giganteus, can be misleading. And the more we find out about the fossil record, the more misleading such discrete names are. 